This talk is about two fundamental non-CPU system local parts of software engineering, which is RAM, which is to say that's data outside of the CPU, and file IO, which is to say data outside of the RAM and the CPU. Okay, those are the two things that we're talking about. Now, I've divided the talk up into four sections. The first section will cover the computer, particularly the CPU and RAM, as well as the OS and processes and address space. This might seem um, oddly familiar to all of you, except I found a lot of people know a certain amount about the CPU, but not enough to make good use of uh, these fundamental systems. The second section will look at the problems that arise from memory management, so that's allocation, exhaustion, deallocation, and some management strategies. In the third section, we'll move on to offline data and examine why we need offline data, dividing processes and files, file sources, and summarizing caching. And then finally, in the fourth section, we'll look at how you actually get data into RAM. We'll start with the CPU. I should remark, I've got the questions up on my left-hand side. No, oh, that's my right-hand side. That's my left-hand side. Um, I've got the, the uh, chat window up there. If you want to ask questions in the chat, please pop them in. I'll be sort of looking over periodically to see if there are any questions. Um, I've set aside about two hours. Um, the talk should take about an hour, um, but please ask, ask questions throughout, and uh, we'll, we'll get through all this, and I'll answer as many questions as I can. I'm really pleased to be here. I really, really am. I like presenting to new communities, and I'm pleased that you've managed to form a new community and you've managed to find each other. It's really important, particularly in these days, that we you know, that we find the people that we love and, the, and that we have common interest with and we bind together. Um, right now, you're suffering enormously in India and we're watching you from all around the world in horror and sadness. So, you know, do keep your community strong and do look after yourselves and do take care of each other. Um, but let's start with the CPU. Here's a conceptual diagram of the CPU. Now let's start with the ALU. So the ALU performs the arithmetic and logical functions that are the work of the computer. So two registers hold the input, one register holds the instruction to perform, and the accumulator receives the result of the operation. That's basically it. That's a computer. So for example, when adding two numbers, one number is placed in the A register, another in the B register, and the add instruction is put in the instruction register. The ALU performs the addition and puts the result in the accumulator, and the accumulator content is then placed in the cache for later use. That's how a computer works. Similarly, for logical operations like AND, or OR, or exclusive OR, there are two inputs, there's one instruction and one output, and that output is stored in the cache. The ALU also performs operations to jump to different places in memory for retrieving the next instruction, and that result will end up in the instruction pointer. The instruction pointer specifies where to get the next instruction from. The CPU never actually accesses RAM. RAM is fed to the cache by the memory management unit, and the CPU operates on data in the cache. The CPU can get to the cache much faster than RAM. Cache memory is much faster than RAM, and it is closer to the ALU, so there is less delay. A lot of work is done assessing whether the cache needs to be filled from RAM or written back to RAM, Caches that are further from the ALU, level two and level three, are used to predict what data or instructions might be needed next, moving them into L1 cache when needed. L1 cache is typically only a few kilobytes, while L2 and L3 cache are a few megabytes. Each core in the CPU will have its own L1 cache, while L2 may be shared between pairs of cores, and L3 may be shared between all cores. Caches are part of the CPU package. The memory management unit manages the data flow between RAM and the CPU, and we'll be going into much more detail about this later. So RAM, random access memory, is connected to the CPU via the motherboard. It's much slower than cache RAM, as the data has further to travel between components. However, individual bits stored within the RAM take the same amount of time to address, regardless of where they're stored on the chip. RAM is volatile in that any data is only stored on it while power is applied. After power is withdrawn, all data is lost. My first computer, this was a long time ago, had one kilobyte 
kilobytes of RAM. I bought it in 1981. Typically, you would expect to find at least four gigabytes on a laptop. My desktop machine at home, <coughs> which is where I am right now, has 16 gigabytes of RAM. But my work machine has 64 gigabytes of RAM. And this is significantly larger than the cache by several orders of magnitude. This broad distribution of RAM makes life quite difficult for the PC games developer. While consoles have fixed amounts of RAM, PC players with lots of RAM expect to see the benefit of being better equipped. So Steam surveys reveal that there is a broad spread of installations among our players. We have to accommodate laptop players as well as professional gamers with hugely powered devices. RAM also comes in different bandwidths. That is the amount of data that can be read from or written to the RAM per second. But these variations are dwarfed by the growing disparity of speed between the CPU and memory outside the CPU chip. This is known as the memory wall. Sorry about that. Something's going strangely wrong here. But look, an important reason for this disparity is the limited communication bandwidth beyond chip boundaries. And this is known as the bandwidth wall. And between 1986 and 2000, CPU speed improved at an annual rate of about 55%, while memory speed only improved at about 10%. So memory latency has become a significant bottleneck in computer performance. But CPU speed improvements have hit a physical barrier, and Intel summarized this in 2005. I'm just going to read you quite a long quote, so do bear with me. First of all, as chip geometry shrink and clock frequencies rise, the transistor leakage current increases, leading to excess power consumption and heat. Secondly, the advantages of higher clock speeds are in part negated by memory latency, since memory access times have not been able to keep pace with increasing clock frequencies. Third, for certain applications, traditional serial architectures are becoming less efficient as processes get faster due to the so-called von Neumann bottleneck further undercutting any gains that frequency increases might otherwise buy. In addition, partly due to the limitations in the means of producing inductance within solid state devices, resistance capacitance delays in signal transmission are growing as feature sizes shrink, imposing an additional bottleneck that frequency increases don't address. This is rather serious. Anyway, we now have to divert from hardware to software as we consider operating systems and processes. When power is first applied to the CPU, it will look for an instruction source so that it can do work. Now, this is usually provided by BIOS, a basic input-output system, which schedules communication between the various components on the motherboard. However, the BIOS is typically a very dumb artifact and will search storage for somewhere to bootstrap the system from. And typically, this will be internal storage, a local drive, but it could also be a USB drive or even a network device. And the bootstrap program will launch a thread which simply awaits further instructions to spawn new threads. At least that was the situation back in the 80s. Modern operating systems distinguish between threads and processes, which we will consider shortly. The first few new processes are likely to be programs for monitoring network traffic or keyboard and mouse input. Other processes will include programs for sending signals to external storage and displays. And these processes will tick over in the background, waiting for something to happen. The final process to be launched is likely to be the shell, with which a user can spawn new processes. Such processes are identified with names, and the OS knows how to resolve those to locations where the executable image can be found. The image is loaded into memory and started, and then waits for a signal to terminate. The process may not accept input at all. For example, it might simply print a message to the screen and terminate itself immediately, or it may await user input and respond to it in different ways, terminating when the user demands. Operating systems don't limit the number of processes that can be run simultaneously. It schedules CPU time to each process by whatever, you know, by whatever algorithm is in favor at the time. If there are many cores, then many processes can run simultaneously, although this can cause contention for resources, of course. And the only thing that does limit the number of processes is the amount of memory available to store them. If a process is requested and there's nowhere to put it, then the OS will simply signal an error. There are, however, some mitigations against that problem, and we'll be covering that in the next section. Let's look at address spaces. Now, an address space defines a range of discrete addresses, each of which may correspond to a RAM cell or a disk sector or a network host or a peripheral device or any logical or physical entity. 
As software engineers, it's most likely that you will associate addresses with RAM. For a program to read or write data, each unit of data must have a storage address. The number of addresses is limited by the computer architecture. And like the hierarchical design of postal addresses, some nested domain hierarchies appear as a directed ordered tree, such as with a domain name system or a directory structure. On the internet, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority allocates ranges of IP addresses to various registries so each can manage their parts of the global internet address space. Now, address spaces feature mapping layers and translation layers. And this means that some address at one level of abstraction must be translated to a lower level of abstraction. For example, a file system on a logical disk operates linear sector numbers. They must be translated to absolute sector addresses um, via addition of the partition's first sector address. Then for a disk drive connected via, for example, a parallel ATA, each of them must be converted to logical cylinder head sector addresses. Then it's converted back to LBA by the disk controller and then finally to physical cylinder head and sector numbers. It's a big round trip. The domain name system maps its names to and from network specific addresses, usually IP addresses, which in turn may be mapped to link layer network addresses via address resolution protocol. A network address translation may occur on the edge of different IP spaces, such as the local area network and the internet. Of course, this, the obvious example of virtual to physical address translation is virtual memory, where different pages of virtual address space map either to page file or to main memory physical address space. It's possible that several numerically different virtual addresses all refer to one physical address, and hence to the same physical byte of RAM. And it's also possible that a single virtual address maps to zero, one, or more than one physical address. So a page is a fixed length contiguous block of virtual memory described by a single entry in the page table. It's the smallest unit of data for memory management. And similarly, a page frame is the smallest fixed length contiguous block of physical memory into which memory pages are mapped by the operating system. So page size is usually determined by the processor architecture. Traditionally, pages in a system had uniform size such as 4,096 bytes. A system with a smaller page size uses more pages, requiring a page table that occupies more space. For example, if a 32-bit virtual address space is mapped to 4,000 pages, that's 2 to the 12th power. The number of virtual pages is 2 to the power of 32, divided by 2 to the power of 12, which is 2 to the power of 20, or about a million. However, if the page size is increased to 32K, that's 2 to the 15th power, then only about 100,000 pages are required. And this matters because since every access to memory must be mapped from virtual to physical address, reading the page table every time can be quite costly. Therefore, a very fast kind of cache, the translation look aside buffer, the TLB as it's known, is often used. The TLB is of limited size, and when it cannot satisfy a given request, that's a cache miss or a TLB miss, the page tables must be searched manually, either in hardware or software, depending on the architecture, for the correct mapping. Larger page sizes mean that a TLB cache of the same size can keep track of larger amounts of memory, which avoids the costly TLB misses. Processes rarely fill up pages, so a lot of fragmentation will take place. Larger page sizes lead to more fragmentation, unless you are managing the allocation of memory carefully yourself. Individual pages can be marked by the operating system as being read-only or read-write or no-execute or execute-only or only accessible to certain categories of user. This also will be useful later. Now, swapping, things get interesting here because since we have a direct mapping between the TLB and physical RAM, we aren't actually limited by how much RAM we have. On a 64-bit architecture, we have access to 16 exabytes of address space which is far, far more RAM than you will ever find in a single machine. This means it's possible to exhaust RAM quite easily. As you add more processes to your operating environment, each of them will demand a few pages of address space. When the page table has accounted for all the RAM, modern processors can simply map the address space to other storage. So the smart thing to do is to identify the least recently used page and move it into slower storage, freeing that page of RAM for the new demands. And this is called swapping. If that page is required, the least recently used page is swapped out and that page is returned to RAM. Now let's walk through the diagram. 
So at point number one, you can see the CPU requests a virtual address either to write to or to read from. So the TLB either holds that address locally, in the case of 2A, or there's a TLB miss and it has to search the page table for it, which is in the case of 2B. If there's a TLB miss, the TLB is updated. Next, that page is hit for data if it's in RAM. If it isn't in RAM, then we have a segmentation fault. And the OS will intercept this segmentation fault and find out where on the secondary storage it stored that page. And then the page in storage is swapped for a page in RAM and the page table is updated. And this hammers your external storage, of course. Configuring a partition on your fastest drive is the best way to make this happen. But filling up your TLB will lead to dramatically reduced performance. So resist the temptation to keep allocating without regard for your operating environment. And this effectively treats offline storage as non-volatile memory. It's part of the address space. As a result, we have power consumption reduction options. Today's PCs are very thirsty beasts. My primary machine has acquired 850 watt power supply. It sits under my desk, consuming power, throwing out heat. My secondary machine has a 600 watt power supply. It also sits under my desk, consuming power and throwing out heat. And this is great in the winter, but not so much in the summer. And a lot of effort goes into designing parts that only sip as much power as they need, just a little bit. And this reduces the power consumption, but does not eliminate it. The only way to eliminate it is to switch the machine off and I'm not using it. And this can hit productivity quite badly. In the 90s, I worked at a code shop where starting my machine would take 30 minutes, a couple of minutes to get to Windows, and then an eternity starting up my IDE because of the interlinked nature of the projects, their dependencies, the security certificates, the offline repository, and so on. I had to leave my machine on overnight or burn 30 minutes every morning starting it up. And ultimately, this is what I did. And I used the time saying hello to everyone and making a cup of tea and reading emails on my portable and all that sort of thing while I waited for my IDE to sort itself out. However, if you can treat offline storage as non-volatile memory, then it's a simple matter to move everything there and power down the motherboard and all the peripherals. Now, this requires some cooperation from the BIOS. It needs to be able to identify two different power down states and restart accordingly. Restarting from hibernation simply means skipping the usual BIOS startup and restoring everything to RAM from a special file on offline storage and carrying on where it left off. And if you run Windows, you'll know that file is hyberfill.sys. And I can't begin to imagine the impact it's had upon carbon emission over the past, 50, over the past years. So that's a quick introduction to a PC and the relevant working parts. We looked at the CPU and how it simply does arithmetic and logic and moves stuff around. Then we looked at RAM as an off CPU storage mechanism, and then the OS and processes, and particularly their lifecycle. The nature of address space, how it's organized independently of RAM, and how page management works to achieve this independence. Then we looked at how swapping works to cope with multiple processes consuming more address space than you have RAM available, and a direct application to hibernation and reducing power consumption. So are there any questions so far? Am I going slow enough? Do you want me to go faster? Everything's fine. No questions. Great. Anka, you wanting to say something? Yes. Uh, Guy, what about uh, GPU and the memory that has? Um, I, have an, I have an entire other talk about GPU memory management. Um, so GPU is a separate. Uh, a GPU card sits in a, actually, we talk about buses later. I'll come back to that, OK? OK. OK. Right, so let's press on with memory management. Now, you may, you're probably familiar with automatic and static storage duration. And they don't present much of a problem, because they automatically are constructed, automatically destroyed, and the memory that's allocated to them is automatically dealt with. We have to start worrying, though, about dynamic storage duration. So the thing with dynamic storage duration is this is a custom, custom life cycle and it's controlled entirely programmatically. It's controlled entirely by you, the programmer. So first, let's look at how we commence the life cycle. And if you've ever done any C programming, you'll be f familiar with the idiom of malloc. Then init, where you would call the malloc function to allocate some address space, and then call an init function to initialize that memory. And this is a rather dangerous way of doing things. The memory isn't ready until the init function has been called. And it's very easy to insert code prior to the init function 
but subsequent to the ballot function. This code may start out as just checking things are okay, that it's legal to initialize the memory, but it is all too easy to insert function calls that inadvertently rely on the initialization having already taken place and things can go very wrong very easily. The new keyword is the key here. So this combines the malloc and the init in one single expression. And this keyword allocates some memory and then constructs the object in place in a single indivisible invocation. And you may have heard coding guidelines along the lines of no raw loops or no raw new. And these are both excellent guidelines to follow. And I'm telling you about the new operator so that you understand precisely what's going on under the hood. And I will show, show you how to completely avoid using new later. Ah, question, we'll be talking about cache aware programming, array of structs versus structs of arrays. No, this is more about moving RAM around the around a computer. Again, I have yet another talk about array of structs versus struct of arrays. Um, but I can answer questions on that later. So how does the new operator work? Well, the new operator calls operator new. And this is a function declared at global namespace scope by the vendor implementation in the new header. It has this signature. So there are several overloads, 22 actually. Um, we won't look at them all, but we will concentrate on this one. They all work in approximately the same way as all good overloads should. Now, typically, operator new will simply call the malloc function. And this is no surprise. All we're trying to do is make an existing idiom safer. But what does the malloc function do? Well, on Windows, and I'm going to be working mainly on Windows here because that's the platform I use most of all. It's the one I'm most familiar with. But on Windows, the operating system operates heaps for handling allocation of address space. There's an entire library just for managing and tracking heap allocation. The sort of things you want to know is how many allocations are still in play. And this is important because at the end of static deinitialization, you want that number to be zero. If it isn't, then you have a memory leak somewhere, and this is bad. If you don't know where that leak is, you don't know whether it will accumulate and eventually bring your program to a standstill. The existence of memory leaks is the primary reason why you should never call new directly. The default operator new is absolutely the worst case scenario as well. It knows nothing about the sorts of sizes that are going to be passed to it nor does it know anything about how long that memory is going to be required. It's entirely permissible to replace operator new with your own definition. To be clear, this isn't overloading. Replacing is a different thing entirely and requires careful handling. Although the standard declares operator new, it doesn't define it in line. It's defined in the runtime library. If you provide your own replacement, visibly defined in the translation unit, then the compiler will be able to resolve all calls and won't require linking to the library version. Now, reasons why you might want to do this, including knowing much more about the execution environment. You may want to redirect requests for particular amounts of memory to a special allocation routine, and we'll look at this sort of activity shortly. Once operator new has secured storage for the new operator, the constructor is invoked, creating a new instance of the object at the returned address. So memory used for static storage is consumed at a startup, and it remains consumed and is released at shutdown. Memory used for automatic storage is consumed from the stack for the duration of a block scope and released at the end of the block scope. And the advantage that this presents is that memory is released in reverse order of allocation. It's deterministic and can simply be stacked up like a tower of blocks, but this is not the case for dynamic storage. The whole point is that the duration is conditional on the execution of the program, which leaves us with a problem. Since objects are not destroyed in reverse order of construction, we can get fragmentation. And this is where some parts of address space are unallocated and yet surrounded by allocated address space. And this conveys a false impression of how much address space we have available to us. In the picture, you can see a typical example of fragmentation. About two thirds of the address space is in use and a third is available for use. If you Im imagine that this is a one megabyte block of address space, you might suggest that maybe 300 kilobytes of address space is free. But if you were to ask for that 300 kilobytes of address space, you would be denied. There is no contiguous block of space of that size available. It's very difficult to measure fragmentation and to decide whether you have a problem. Strategies exist to compact fragmented memory, which works by returning a handle to memory rather than a pointer, locking it when you need it and unlocking it when you no longer need it. And this allows your compaction routine to shuffle things around. But this is rather unsuitable for C++ object lifetimes. The large part of my job at Creative Assembly in the last decade was dealing with this problem and coming up with some solutions. So let's look at some of these. 
So the first strategy is called the stack allocator. And this effectively creates your own private stack somewhere. It relies on allocations being destroyed in reverse order of construction, exactly like a stack. And you might wonder why you can't simply use the thread stack for this. But consider a typical application, a UI menu system. When you start a game, you're presented with a screen containing options such as starting a game or modifying graphic settings or setting game difficulties. You might opt for graphic settings. There may be a further menu offering resolutions with a checkbox to choose running in a window. When you're happy with your settings, you navigate to the previous screen and then back to the front screen once you're happy with your graphic settings. Now, you could decide to simply build each screen on the fly and discard it as you navigate forwards and backwards. But there is a chance of fragmentation. You may undertake other allocations while you're choosing options whose lifetime exceeds that of the menu screen. And this is the classic cause for fragmentation, in fact, allocating some address space in order to allocate something else. And this, of course, is to be expected if you want something to outlast the current function, which is the perfect perf purpose of dynamic storage, then you will likely need to create dependencies to create it in the first place. It's a smarter idea to separate the things whose lifetime you know from the things whose lifetime you don't. You could allocate a large slab of address space when you start the game, just for the front end, and discard it when you start playing the game, retaining the settings that you created elsewhere. You have the additional advantage of knowing that things will be destroyed in reverse order, so whenever you ask for more address space, you simply insert the requested size at the address of the end of the last allocation and hand back the address after the size. It's the fastest possible allocation strategy and its similarity to the stack demonstrates why the stack is such a popular mechanism. Now, sticking with the idea of leveraging your knowledge about lifetime and order of destruction, we move on to the frame allocator. So the purpose of this is to collect together items that you know are going to exist for a particular amount of time. And the typical example is the game loop. I write games, I'm going to be talking a lot about games. Do stop me if you're finding this a little too alien. Um, your game loop is likely to be really quite complicated. You create many objects to describe what's going on in your game world and work out how your world should be updated. But many of those objects will only be relevant for a single iteration of your loop and will need to be created anew again. If you know what those objects are, you can bundle them together into their own chunk of address space. And at the end of each iteration of your loop, you can ensure that there has been appropriate cleanup. There should be no objects remaining in the address space. These Mayfly, Mayfly objects would ordinarily cause ghastly fragmentation. And these are called Mayflies because the Mayfly exists for one day out of an entire year. Short-lived objects are typically the smaller ones from your solution domain of types. As your regular heap fills up with longer-lived objects, little holes are poked into it here and there. Best to keep them all in one place. You might be wondering how to specify a strategy, and I'll be getting onto that at the end of this section. But we're describing a particular level of abstraction, which is that of allocating and deallocating address space. One of the great features of C++ is its support for many different abstraction mechanisms, allowing us to think about only what is relevant to the problem at hand, and to defer implementation details to a different level of abstraction. You'll be pleased to hear that a lot of work has been done on supporting custom allocators in C++, and that you can easily slot all of these strategies into the standard containers. So our third strategy is memory pools. So the piece of knowledge that we're leveraging here is that we know how big most of our objects are going to be. For example, you might know that 30% of your allocations are going to be objects which are 144 bytes in size. Given this information, you might decide to allocate a big chunk of address space that is reserved for objects of 144 bytes. You can then keep an index of flags saying whether each slot is used or free. And the advantage of this approach is that searching for somewhere to put such an object is much quicker than normal since it's a matter of iterating through your block and finding the first free slot. You know it's the right size and so your work is done straight away. Simply flag the slot as occupied and return the address. Another advantage to this approach is that you can easily free the address space as well. Since you know that the address points to something that is 144 bytes long, then all you need to do is consider the address at the start of your block of 144 byte objects, and then subtract that from the address of the block in question, divided by 144, and you have the slot number. And it's only a little slower than a stack allocation. Indeed, if you have a stack allocation of identical sizes, then it's simply a matter of incrementing and decrementing the count of how many allocations have been made each time you allocate or freeze some address space. The only tricky part is deciding how much space to allocate up front for your pool per size. The assumption has to be that the sum total of all your dynamic storage is going to exceed the address space available. 
you might write a very small compact game that fits snugly into 48 kilobytes of address space. But this is far from the general case. You're not going to be able to simply hold all of your dynamic storage objects at the same time. You're going to have to destroy some to make room for others. Just as the stack grows and shrinks, so does the heap occupation. Even in these days of 64-bit address spaces, you have to worry about page faults. The reason you want to avoid fragmentation is to prevent additional pages from being requested from the OS. Fragmentation causes swapping, which drastically deteriorates your application's performance. The reason that an application will have a... So our, all our games have a minimum specification on the side of the box or in, in the advertising. It ensures that players with three gigabytes of RAM in their laptops won't be surprised when Total War, which is the game that we write, runs so slowly. We can't optimize our game for performance if your system is going to be spending so much of its time swapping. Pushing data over the bus takes time, as we'll see in the next section. Good allocation strategies minimize fragmentation. So we have a new question. Can we allocate memory at specific address using new operator? Yes, you can. It's called placement new, but you need to make sure that you have, you have access to that address. How do you debug memory management related issues? Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a deep skill. Um, we talk about, in fact, we'll be getting into that a little bit later. Um, if I don't answer any, either of these questions sufficiently well, then I'm happy to return to them at the end of the presentation. Right, our next strategy is stack allocators. So this is rather like a frame allocator, except that the allocation object contains all of the address space as part of the object. So let's talk about a small string optimization. So a basic string class of single width characters contains a pointer to the buffer where the characters are stored, along with the length of the, length of the string. So in a 64-bit system, that will be eight bytes for the pointer and four bytes for the length, which is 12 bytes in total. Many strings are less than 12 bytes long, my name, for example. So it seems like a waste to allocate a separate buffer when the whole string could be stored internally. Many string implementations will therefore contain a union, or more likely a variant, of an array of 12, char of 12 characters alongside a pointer and an int, and swap between the two when the string traverses the length boundary. Now, the general form of this is known as the small buffer optimization. Contain a buffer that is the length of a pointer and an int, or whatever you will use for the size. And now you could decide that your buffer is going to be bigger than a pointer and an int. In fact, you could make it as big as you like. This is only going to be useful, though, if the allocator object is going to live on the stack rather than on the heap. That is, if it is of automatic storage duration rather than dynamic storage duration. If it lives on the heap, then it saves you nothing. This is meant to be a way of avoiding allocation. So the allocator contains a buffer as part of its member data. And this is the address space that's used for all clients of the allocator. It sits on the stack and you create your containers using this allocator. And you pass this allocator to any called function so that they can use it. When an allocation is required of the allocator, the allocation comes from the buffer. Of course, you need to ensure that the buffer can accommodate all likely users. Alternatively, you could actually treat it like a small buffer optimization, or more precisely, a medium buffer optimization, and fall back to retrieving address space from the heap once the buffer is exhausted. The knowledge that you're making use of here is the approximate size and duration of your allocations within a particular scope. When the name of the allocator falls out of scope, it will be destroyed. And just like the previous allocators, if it isn't empty, you know that there's been a memory leak. So our final strategy is a curious piece, and it's called the double-ended allocator. So a classic fragmentation pattern occurs when you have pairs of objects of vastly different sizes being created together. For example, you may have a mesh that's 12 kilobytes big and a proxy object for the mesh that's only 40 bytes big. Now, when you're making games, a common technique for speeding up rendering is to use simple sprites for objects that are far from the camera and message and uh, meshes for objects that are close. If you have hundreds of a particular entity in view, you know that each will have either a mesh or a proxy sprite. So how to store them? So the problem, of course, is that you'll have lots of allocations and deallocations as the objects move into and out of range of the camera detail threshold. And you'll be destroying a 12 kilobyte object and creating a 40 byte object and then destroying a 40 byte object and creating a 12 kilobyte object. This is going to fragment your memory very badly indeed. The thing that you do know, though, is how many entities you have to keep track of. If you enter a level with a thousand creatures and they're rendered alive or dead for the entire duration, you can make a good guess what the maximum number of creatures will be rendered via mesh and know that the remainder will be rendered with a sprite. 
And this gives you an upper bound on the total amount of storage this will require. The trick is how do you ensure that you store everything in that total amount of storage? Well, the trick is to allocate a block of memory and allocate all the big objects at one end and all the small objects at the other. They will never meet in the middle as long as you get your sums right about how many will be rendered by mesh rather than by sprite. So this is effectively a pool allocator, but with two sizes, and you can be smarter about how much space to allocate for it. The knowledge that you're leveraging here is the association between the two sizes, that one or the other will be chosen, but not both. And this allows you to put bounds on the total and create an allocator that partially eliminates fragmentation by limiting its manifestation to the individual ends of the block. You might store this at game loop level and verify that it was empty at the end of each loop. All right, more questions. Could you please talk a bit? Of, oh, oh, hang on. Could you please talk a bit about how string in, string interning is specified by the standard and ultimately implemented by vendors? Right. So the small string operate, um, optimization is not specified by the standard, but vendors use it because it is an efficient thing to do. The standard library implementers around the world, so we have libc++, C++, libc++, and msv, cstl, they do all talk to each other, they share findings, because it's very important that we come up with an efficient C++ standard library. A lot of people use C++, and it's in everyone's interest that C++ remains an efficient and speedy um, language to use. So there's a lot of exchange of information going on. How do you deal with memory management design for games targeted to different platforms with varying memory specs? That's an excellent question. Um, that's actually quite a big question as well. Um, when you're targeting different platforms, uh, you have to change the very design of your game so that your memory will not be exhausted. You have to ensure that you're not running out of memory. Not all platforms um, will support the same amount of swap and storage. Not all platforms will have the same amount of RAM. So you have to do different things for different platforms. It's a, it is a very tricky problem. Um, and you, it really is just a case of um, tracking your memory management and ensuring that you know where all your memory is and how frequently allocations and deallocations are happening. It's a big problem of, um, of, of measurement. You have to measure everything. You can't control what you can't measure. Can we configure the size that takes the allocation to the smaller size of the pool in the double end allocation? Yes, the idea is that you have an allocator that will um, your, your, your allocator is actually a function which takes one of those which takes one of those two sizes. I think that answers your question. Am I being clear here? Get back to me if you're not. We're going to rush on here because it's uh, it's. Oh, we're moving on. Right. Dynamic storage is initiated with the new operator, which calls operator new. Since we have to manually handle everything and we can't leave things lying around, we have a matching delete operator. Now, when introducing the new operator. Our remarks about malloc and init and how it would be a habit for C programmers to insert progressively more code between the malloc and the init function. The same is true at the other end of the lifetime. When the C programmer was finished with their object, they would call a deinit function and then they would call free. Similarly, the deinit call might end up being followed by calls to diagnostic functions to track what the object had been used for, how long it had been in existence, and so on. And it would be very simple to forget that the deinit function had been called. So the delete operator comes to our rescue in much the same way by fusing together the deinit and free operations into a single line of code. However, again, as with the new operator, ideally you should never see a raw delete operator. You should raise the abstraction level of your machinery management of your memory management beyond these pieces of machinery, just as you wouldn't hand roll your own linked list or your own dynamic array class. So you wouldn't operate at the level of abstraction that demands the use of raw new and delete. And I talk extensively about levels of abstraction in my upcoming book. I have to get a plug in every talk. I have a book coming out later this year called Beautiful C++, which I've authored with Kate Gregory. But anyway, um, abstraction, levels of abstraction is really important. And what you're doing here is you're operating at the correct level of abstraction. And if you take one thing away from this lecture, it's that you should operate at the correct level of abstraction. Most bugs are caused by failing this rule, by failing to separate concerns, by failing to keep classes and functions small, doing one thing well. You should spend as much of your time factoring your solution in the first place as you do writing code. Right, so how does the operator, delete operator work? Well, first of all, it calls the appropriate destructor, 
and then it calls operator delete. Again, this is a function declared at global namespace scope by the vendor implementation in the new header, and it, would, and it has this signature. There are several overloads to match the operator new overloads, and they all work in approximately the same way, as all good overloads should. By default, it will most likely call free. There are some rules about where to put operator delete and how to overload it. First of all, every operator new needs a matching operator delete. And the reason for this is that if the constructor throws an exception, then the runtime will seek to call the matching operator delete. That is the one with the same signature, barring the first parameter, which contains the size in the case of operator new and the address in the case of operator delete. An exception doesn't necessarily mean the end of the program, and there is a promise in the standard to keep everything clean. Therefore, the exception handler must know how to clean up. The only way you can do this is by scheduling a call to operator delete, which matches the call to operator new. Therefore, every operator new overload needs a matching operator delete overload. Secondly, the overloaded operator delete should live in the same translation unit as the overloaded operator new. This isn't enforced by the compiler, but it's good sense. Different overloads may behave in different ways, and also you may want to repeat the same overload, but in a different translation unit context. There's a small fly in the ointment with this, though, which is if you want to reuse this overload in other translation units, things become problematic because of the one definition rule. And the obvious way to overcome this would be to define it as an inline or a static function. But the standard forbids this. The Microsoft compiler classified this as an error starting a couple of years ago, much to my dismay and disappointment. Now, there are excellent reasons why this is forbidden to do with the implementer experience of linker complications. Just don't do this. The correct solution is to create a single translation unit that defines only the overloads you're interested in and bind those at link time to the final executable. This will limit you to one overload per executable, but you might consider creating a tag type to create more specific overloads. Pardon me, something strange is going on here. But finally, it's often forgotten that you can define operator new and operator delete as class member functions. So if you have a specific way that you want to handle the allocation of a class, you're free to do so. But again, you must match your operator new with a corresponding operator delete. Otherwise, chaos will reign. All right, more questions. Um, is there any point to talk about on cached memory and uncached memory? If so, what other things need to be taken care while working with cached memory? That's a big question. I'll answer it at the end. Um, but yes, I can answer that. Right, tracking. Um, since dynamic storage is entirely manually controlled, you need a way of tracking it to ensure that objects don't leak. You can't control what you can't measure. So tracking gives you a way of measuring behavior. The information that you want to track is how much you allocated and when. Periodically, you want to be able to find out how much you've allocated. And there may be points in the execution of your program where you're expecting total allocation to be nil. Well, that particular allocation strategy should be accounting for a known amount, a specific amount of address space. So if your expectations are not met, then you have a way of finding bugs before they manifest themselves more obviously. Now, this is a simple database problem. Um, you can track internal to the process or externally. Um, the Total War code base does all of its memory tracking internally, but that's possibly just because that's how we've always done it. And if we were rebooting the code base, I would recommend sending messages to an external process instead. How much you allocate is easy to track. When it's not so easy, you may want to capture the call stack, for example. But that can be a tricky business in Windows, and at the moment it's not something covered by the standard, although it was added to the working draft of the C++ standard in November. So we should expect to see that in C++ 23. Additionally, some vendors may choose to implement it early, so do watch out. Additional information might include a timestamp in microseconds describing when the address space was allocated, because it can be quite informative to see if there are allocations happening in a sudden flurry of activity, or if they're evenly spread out. You may be able to find scope for a separate allocator to collect items together and reduce fragmentation. Other information you may want to extract from your tracker is how many pages you're making use of. You want to keep this to a minimum. More pages means more swapping. All of your resources come with a cost you're able to track them and ensure that you are not being too greedy, even on a console where yours is the only game running. Efficiency is about using as few resources as possible. A page is a resource. Now, as promised, let's talk about raising the abstraction level because the problem of wrapping everything away out of sight was solved before the first standard was published. This service is offered by Stud Allocator 
So remember that the dynamic storage object lifecycle consists of allocating the memory, constructing the object, destructing the object, and freeing the memory. Well, the allocator class handles two of those operations, the allocation and freeing of memory. Indeed, until C++17, it would also handle construction and destruction, but these function calls were deprecated and removed in C++20 because programmers were simply calling them directly. But the principle is clear. Wrap up your allocation and deallocation function in a per-class specialization of allocator. And you can then use this for your containers. And it's quite unusual to only create one of something. We can actually do better than this, though. The construction and destruction functions don't belong in an allocator object. There were two things going on with allocators. There is the management of a memory resource and the life cycle of the object. This is an incomplete separation of concerns. With the deprecation of the allocator construct and destruct calls, where should we look instead? Well, there's a header called memory resource, which handles all of this now. It defines a class called memory resource and another called polymorphic allocator. Now, memory resource defines two functions, allocate and deallocate. Polymorphic allocator defines several interesting functions, including allocate objects, deallocate objects, new object, delete object, which cover the work of the old allocator interface. But where it differs is that the polymorphic allocator takes a memory resource in the constructor. So the allocation and deallocation of memory is handled by a different object. One downside to all of this, which is contained in the name, is that this is a polymorphic design, and that polymorphism happens at runtime, which means virtual function calls, which can slow down your execution, since the function call is resolved at runtime. But when you write your allocation functions, if you mark them as final, you are hinting to the compiler that the function won't be overridden, and so it's safe to bind the function statically. Now, although this is a deep dive, I have, in fact, only entered the shallows of the allocator classes. There's a lot of exploring to do, and I would hope that you're able to take plenty of notes and look back on the recording and go down all of these rabbit holes yourself. The next item is unique pointer. So this should be your default class for creating anything with dynamic storage duration. So recall that new returns a pointer, and if that pointer is bound to a name, and the name falls out of scope, the address space allocated by new leaks. What if that wasn't the case? What if, when the pointer fell out of scope, the address space was freed? And that's the premise behind unique pointer. It's simply a pointer with ownership semantics. And this is a simple concept, although there are a few things to bear in mind. The first is that it's unique. When you perform an assignment from a unique pointer object, nothing is left behind. The destination of the assignment now contains the object, and the source now contains nothing. If you try and dereference the source, you'll get an address violation exception. So assign from a unique pointer only if you're absolutely certain of the future use of this object. And next, there's a rarely a situation where you should expect to directly create a unique pointer object. You should use make unique instead. The reason for this is that this wraps up the allocation and the construction in a single function call, just like the new operator. However, rather than returning a pointer to the constructed object as the new operator does, it returns a unique pointer to the constructed object with ownership semantics, making leaks impossible. Make unique will use the default operator new and operator delete functions to allocate address space. So the one situation where you will want to directly create a unique pointer object is if you want to use your own allocation functions. And in this case, you will have to make use of unique pointers second template parameter which is the delete function to be used when it's destroyed. The usage then is to create the object separately using a new operator with your own allocation routine and then instantiate a unique pointer with your delete function as a second parameter and with your new object as the constructor parameter. And this covers all the bases. You should use regular allocators for containers and unique pointer for individual objects. I say this covers all the bases because there's one more abstraction available, which is shared pointer. This is a rather more cumbersome object than the unique pointer, since it represents an object with no direct ownership. Rather, many objects have an interest in the object, but no single object governs its lifetime. And this requires a number of things. First, it must be reference counted. So each object participating in ownership requires the object to continue to exist. And when all interested parties have been destroyed, only then can it be destroyed. So every time it's assigned from, we need to increment the reference count. This is not particularly burdensome, but it is an overhead. Next, the shared pointer needs to be thread safe. Every time it's assigned from and every time an owner falls out of scope, the reference count needs to be adjusted. And it needs to be thread safe because if it hits zero, it will be destroyed. But if it hits zero while another, while another object is attempting to increment the reference count, there will be trouble. Thread safety is hilariously expensive and a mutex is not a cheap object to use. And thirdly, all this bookkeeping is an additional cost to the allocation of the object. 
When a shared pointer is brought into existence, it needs to allocate not only the address space for the object, but also the address space for the bookkeeping. And this means two allocations for instantiation. Allocation can be even more expensive than mutex acquisition. Fortunately, there's an additional function called make shared, which will allocate the object and the bookkeeping in a single function allocation. So if you want to use your own allocator, you can call allocate shared instead. Now, if that hasn't put you off using it, then finally, and most seriously, an object with shared ownership is a failure of design. You should be reaching for this because you are interfacing with poorly written code. You should never be using this as a matter of choice or usual practice. If you're consuming a library which returns a shared pointer object, then you should reconsider using the library. One of the fundamental tenets of C++ is that everything is owned by one thing and one thing only. And when an object is destroyed, so are all the things it owns. Diffusing ownership throughout a program is as bad as declaring a singleton, and it is a resource leak in disguise. So now you know how memory management works. We covered the new operator and operator new, fragmentation, allocation strategies, the delete operator and operator delete, tracking, stood allocator and stood unique pointer, stood shared pointer. And I'll pause to take any questions and take a drink of water. Right, two questions. First of all, other than in polymorphic cases, in what other cases will using a std unique point be useful that instantiating the object on the stack wouldn't suffice? Uh, a unique pointer is for, dynamics, is for dynamic storage duration, whereas stack objects are for automatic storage duration. So you would use a unique pointer when you want an object that may outlast the life of the function in which it's created. Um, where the global variable and static variable stored, which part of the data segment? Um, that depends on your implementer, it depends on your linker tools. Um, but I do have a diagram a little later. Aren't allocators obligated to handle deallocate for memory that they do not own hold? They must delegate such deallocates to the global delete. That depends how the allocator is written. Allocators should take full ownership and responsibility of the memory there. They're, um, they're reading, reading to and writing, from, writing to and reading from. Um, does the new allocator have any thread-based optimizations? Um, there is no new allocator. Um, grouping the allocations from a particular thread in range of memory region to get better cache performance. Uh, I would be surprised if that would make a difference. The cache sizes are, well, I don't know, it might actually. I haven't thought about that. But I can tell you there are no thread-based optimizations mandated by the standard, but you may find that implementers might try and implement some. Any more questions? Right, on we go, section three. Right, offline data. So. Offline data is anything that's not part of the executable. There are all sorts of reasons for separating things from the executable, but it's not a requirement that the executable be in multiple parts. In a similar vein, I need to find offline storage as anything that persists when the power to the machine is cycled down. So that means non-volatile storage that is still available when the device is offline. When I first started programming on 8-bit machines, there was no notion of offline data. There was no offline storage available. My computer used cassette tapes as non-volatile storage, but since they were manually controlled by a programmer pressing play on their cassette player, there was a discontinuity of control, and that made them unsuitable for offline storage in any formal sense. All that was available was the, was the opportunity to load a program at the command prompt, press play, and then run it. Now, with only a kilobyte of RAM at my disposal, both my code and my data had very little room for maneuver. That one kilobyte also included temporary data, and it was only when I got to computers with 512 kilobytes and a floppy disk drive that I started to become aware of the idea of offline storage. The disk could store 720 kilobytes of data, which was more than the available RAM. So it became meaningful to only load part of the program and data at any one time. So typically, the entire program would be loaded, and data would be moved in and out as needed. For example, there might be data for running the front end of a game and data for running the actual game. And this would require the creation of a loading screen as game data was loaded over the top of front-end data and vice versa. And as time went on and storage increased, 
online storage in the form of RAM was rapidly outpaced by offline storage in the form of disk drives. My first hard disk drive contained a huge 44 megabytes of storage, while the machine it was attached to contained only one megabyte. And right now, the difference is ludicrous with over six terabytes attached to my 64 gigabyte motherboard, let alone what I can reach over the network. And these ratios show no sign of diminishing as drives become ever larger and consoles start to appear without any local offline storage. Now, the first kind of offline data to consider is the DLL. And you might find it jarring that this is offline data, but it's not part of the executable. And all code is data. Now, what's special about this data is that it is executable. DLLs are a way of storing libraries of codes that can be added to a program without having to recompile and relink. For example, if you have a compression library that you ship as a DLL, then your clients don't have to compile and link it into their own executable. It's simply available at the point of use. Periodically, Microsoft releases new runtime libraries for C and C++, which have enjoyed some bug fixes or performance maintenance. And when you install these, any client code immediately benefits from these improvements without having to do any other work. And this also happens to the operating system. Whenever a program is run, it will link to several operating system DLLs, which are periodically updated for security reasons, as well as performance or bug fix reasons. And you enjoy the benefit of this library without having to rebuild any code. And this is especially useful if you're unable to build the code, which is the case with most commercial software. DLLs aren't the only kind of executable library. Driver files, which are used to operate peripherals, are libraries which the operating system uses to broker communications between the OS and the device. Again, driver manufacturers can ship new drivers without users having to rebuild the operating system. And if any of you are regular Linux users, you'll know that such benefits aren't available to you, although with any luck, modern packaging systems will have insulated you from the horrors of kernel recompilation. The way that DLLs work is that they define symbols in an export table in a format which is defined by the operating system manufacturer. Code in the client executable will load the library file, search its export table for the required functions, and retrieve function pointers. The client executable will contain jump tables for those functions, so that any function call is effectively a virtual function, since it jumps to the jump table and from there to the function in the DLL. One significant difference between DLLs and static libraries is that a DLL can only be loaded once per process. Additional copies cannot be loaded. A static library can be bound to an executable and to DLLs and live in the process multiple times over. And this can be problematic when it comes to static data since copies may exist in several places. Right, I'm gonna to have to pause here. I've just looked, seen the time. I'm taking far longer than I was originally scheduled to take. Um, I'm actually about two thirds of the way through, and I think there's another 15 or 20 minutes to go. Um, now, I can either carry on or I can um, skip a few slides and look at the meat or um, perhaps answer Q&A. So perhaps, Anchor, if you could coordinate whether or not I, I just plow on or edit what I've got, that would be helpful. I guess. I'd be really happy for you to cover the entire content, but I guess okay. in, favor of, in favor of time, maybe uh, uh, we'll take the other option. Just skip some well, slides. I'm happy, I'm happy to go all the way through. It's your audience I'm more concerned about because they all expect it to be here for an hour and I may keep them here for longer. If the audience is happy for me to carry, to, to carry on with the, with the rest of the text, that's absolutely great. Yeah, I guess we can as well check Guys, that's what I'm going one. on. Okay. That's good. Carry on, carry on, carry on. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You, yeah, you, you honor me with your attention. <laughs> the talk is Thanks. awesome. Carry on, please. Oh, this is, oh, more praise, more praise. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, then. Right. So let's talk about Windows 95. Because up until Windows 95, importing a library was done by hand in code. You would call a function called load library and then you'd manually specify the symbol you were looking for, and then you'd retrieve an address to it. And you would use this address to build up a namespace of function pointers, and then you dereference them and invoke them when you wanted to call a function. This was labor intensive, and it could be very error prone as well. Uh, if you had similarly named function identifiers, for example, and you couldn't do any overloading, no function overloading was available because you're looking for a string and overloading reuses the string name, the identifier of a function. Apart from all of that, though, it worked fine. But when Windows 95 shipped, it became possible to automate this. You could create a DLL 
and an import library. By binding your executable to the import library, you could let that library deal with the DLL loading and the function pointer fix up. This made life less error prone and was a great quality of life improvement. And there is still good reason though to take the load library route. Because one thing you can do is hot load a DLL while your program is running. So we found that during the development of Total War, we would want to make frequent changes to the user interface, which is a hugely complex piece of code and a hugely complex piece of operation. But we didn't want to rely on offline data to drive the UI. We wanted to encode it all in the executable. It was faster that way. Now, the turnaround time for exiting and restarting the game was problematic. It could take up to 10 minutes to return to the front end. So we developed a new workflow where we would build the UI library, unload the old one, copy the new one into the binaries folder where the executable and all the DLLs lived, and then reload the library. It got to the stage where we could run the game on one machine, rebuild the UI library on another machine, and at the press of a button, turn around the UI, li UI library in under a second. This kind of hot loading made, devel made, de made development a lot easier because long iteration times are the enemy of productivity. You always need to be on the lookout for things that leave you with time to participate in chair hockey. There are always better things you can be done, you can be doing, but the best thing you can be doing is not waiting around for a build system to deliver the goods. Keeping builds short and turn around snappy is what will make your development process profitable. Optimization doesn't just take place in code execution, but also in code development. Now, here's a diagram. Remember that there are two things in programming, execution and state. So here's another representation of the parts of a program, and this is quite an elderly representation dating back to the 1960s. The part at the bottom is labeled text, and this is where the executable data lives. The term comes from assembly language. Um, my guess is that the name comes from the other use of the section because the .text section contains data that doesn't change during execution. So this can be put into ROM if needed into read-only memory. And that makes it useful for code, but it also makes it useful for strings of text that don't change. For example, char const object, char, char array, constants arrays of chars, or constants like the speed of light, just simple values. The data section denotes objects that can change during the course of execution. So this is data that can be initialized at compile time or link time. So for C, this would have been built-in types that were declared with an initial value at file scope. For C++, this denotes global namespace scope. Data with static storage duration and thread local storage duration would live in the data section. Note that there's a third section called .bss, which is for data that is declared but not defined. Perhaps it cannot be defined until runtime when the command line has been passed, or it relies on external inputs that are collected after startup. We've already covered the heap for dynamic storage duration and the stack for automatic storage duration, so I won't dwell on that, but observe that they grow from either end of the address space. So this is a total summary of all the data you'll find in a process. Another thing we might consider is how you declare data in the, pro in the first place. Now there is a proposal called the embed proposal if you follow that link. In fact, it's a good idea to get used to wg.21 slash link. Sorry, wg21.link, because that's where all of the committee papers are, are, uh, are available from. And you can also get a copy of the standard there too. Anyway, there is a proposal called the embed proposal. Which, and the motivation for this proposal opens with a quote from me. I'm very keen on stood embed. I've been hand embedding data in executables for nearly 40 years now. Now, sometimes you have large amounts of data that you want to embed in your executable, which is machine generated. For example, animation meshes are collections of points in space, and it would be helpful to be able to embed these in your code and allow your program to reason about the data it's going to be using at compile time rather than at runtime. Strictly speaking, process data isn't offline data, it's part of the process. Offline data lives outside of the process in some other storage medium. On a typical domestic computer or console, that has historically meant punch cards or a tape or a disc or a cartridge or a whole host of other storage devices. And as I remarked earlier, offline storage sizes have increased at dramatic speeds, far outpacing the amount of RAM on a motherboard. And this is where we get into the meat of this section of the talk. Because the first question to ask is why is there any offline data at all? We've seen that we could simply embed all the data into the process at compile time and rely on the operating system to handle paging data into and out of memory. This would solve installation issues, such as ensuring that the data hasn't been corrupted by creating a single data check for a single file. Versioning becomes simpler because there is only one object to worry about. Version data is no longer an issue. 
But unfortunately, this brings us to the heart of the problem, because sometimes version updates only require the update of a few hundred bytes of data. Our Warhammer 2 is huge. It's, it's 50 or 60 gigabytes. That's our last game. And nobody wants to be downloading a single 60 gigabyte file every time there is an update. Additionally, the iteration time for building would be immense. The process of building games has for a long time now worked on the idea of having external data that is loaded into RAM when it's needed. Now, that's not to say that it isn't possible to return to the days of single file games. After all, this is just an indexing problem. Retrieving data from outside of the process is a case of requesting an API with an identifier, such as a file name, and receiving a pointer to the data. It is entirely possible to create an API which can handle an OS file system, a virtual file system of packed data into larger files, or a database embedded into the executable. Now, there are solutions to these problems. It's long been possible to perform diff installations, but only a part of a file is updated according to an instruction schema, describing how to make the changes. This whole milieu forms the basis of a project I'm working on in my spare time, a universal data requesting abstraction. Now, the final kind of offline data is that which is remote from the machine itself. This is data which is retrieved from a network connection. And there are additional complications here. One feature of local storage is that it's extremely reliable. It shares a power supply with the CPU. There are direct electrical connections between the device and the CPU along which signal data travels. And this allows for some good speed optimizations. We know how long data is going to take to arrive from the storage medium into RAM. This is no longer the case when the data is stored off the machine. You cannot know how long it will take data to arrive. It may have to come from anywhere in the world. You can't be sure data will arrive in the same order in which it was requested. You can't even be sure that an individual piece of data will arrive in one continuous stream, uninterrupted by other data requests. But despite this inconvenience, it's a growing trend to see games storing their data away from the user's machine. This can aid security and revenue protection. It complicates piracy and it deters all but the most dedicated of miscreants. And of course, it requires the user to have an active connection to the internet and sufficient bandwidth not to delay operation of the game. Again, this is a matter of levels of abstraction. All that client code is interested in is the retrieval of a buffer of data in exchange for an identifier. If your API is able to simply search a range of sources for data, this isn't a problem for you. After all, this is exactly what a browser does. It simply exchanges a uniform resource locator, a URL, for a pile of data and then renders it. And the reason I'm laboring this point is because the big leaps in gaming, for example, are made when people ask, but why are we doing this? When graphics card started to appear in the mid 1990s, it wasn't new hardware. It was simply hardware that was made available to consumer grade machines. We'd spent ages mapping textures onto polygons, but suddenly we were able to shunt this job off to additional hardware. The circumstances that surrounded the use of external file systems in the early 90s are not present now. So perhaps it's time for a new paradigm for data retrieval. So we can summarize the entire data story in terms of caches. Recall that the CPU runs an ALU that takes two pieces of data, performs an operation on it, and returns a single piece of result data. Typically, CPUs have more than one register per core. And the sum total of all these registers we can think of as level zero cache right next to the ALU. So let's take a historical perspective on cache. As the x86 processors reached clock rates of 20 megahertz in the 386, small amounts of fast cache memory began to appear in systems to improve performance. And this was because the DRAM used for main memory had significant latency, up to 120 nanoseconds. And the cache was constructed from more expensive but much faster SRAM memory cells, which at the time had latencies of around 10 to 25 nanoseconds. So the early caches were actually external to the processor and typically located on the motherboard in the form of devices placed in sockets to enable the cache as an optional extra or as an upgrade feature. Some versions of the Intel 386 processor could support 16 to 256 kilobytes of external cache. Now with the 486 processor, an eight kilobyte cache was integrated directly into the CPU die. This cache was termed level one cache to differentiate it from the slower on motherboard or level two cache. Those on motherboard caches were much larger with the most common size being 256K. The popularity of on motherboard cache continued through the Pentium MMX era, but was made obsolete by the introduction of SDRAM and the growing disparity between bus clock rates and CPU clock rates, which caused on motherboard cache to be only slightly faster than main memory. <laughs> 
The next development in cache implementation in the x86 microprocessors began with the Pentium Pro, which brought the secondary cache onto the same package and clocked at the same frequency as the microprocessor. On motherboard caches enjoyed prolonged popularity though, thanks to AMD processors that still used socket seven, which was previously used by Intel with on motherboard caches. So if anybody remembers the AMD K63, it included 256 kilobytes of on-die level two cache and took advantage of the on-board cache as a third level cache named L3. So motherboards with up to two megabytes of on-board cache were produced. So you'd have two levels of cache on the, on the chip and one level of cache on the motherboard. After the socket seven became obsolete, on motherboard cache disappeared from the x86 systems entirely. But the three levels of caches were used again. First with the introduction of multiple processor cores, where the L3 cache was added to the CPU die, it became common for the total cache sizes to be increasingly larger in newer processor generations. And it's not uncommon to find level three cache sizes of tens of megabytes. Now, Intel introduced a level four on package cache with the Haswell microarchitecture. Crystalwell Haswell iCPUs, equipped with the GT3E variant of Intel's integrated Iris Pro graphics, effectively feature 128 megabytes of embedded DRAM on the same package, 128 megabytes. This level four cache is shared dynamically between the on-die GPU and CPU and serves as a victim cache to the CPU's L3 cache. That's where things get evicted to. The story doesn't necessarily end there though, because we can think of RAM as level five cache and local offline storage as level six cache and remote offline storage as level seven cache. It gives a picture of data retrieval, which moves from large to small, from slow to fast, from remote storage to drive storage to RAM to CPU. So that's offline data. We covered process size and DLLs, import library versus load library, process data, off RAM data, remote data, and cache levels. I'll pause to take any questions. Right, sorry, it's a bit lengthy. Not related to this session, but query on management. I'll speak on that afterwards. Debug mode with reduced memory allocation. Uh, right, uh, are there any other questions? Your question is good, Rakesh, but I will, announce, I will talk about it after the session. Uh, it looks like I've got people answering the question anyway. Right, let's move on to the final section. File I.O. So File I.O. deals with getting data into RAM. So now C++ offers us two facilities for achieving this. The first is via the I.O. streams library using fstream. Now the constructor takes a file name and an open mode, and there are three ways of retrieving data from it which it inherits from the basic iStream parent. The first two are the functions get and get line. Get retrieves a single character, while get line retrieves characters until a new line is encountered. This may seem rather strange. Why is everything character based? Well, the streams library takes a character type as a template, and it's a very Unix way of doing things. Everything in Unix is either file or a process. It's state and execution again. The third function is more interesting and extracts data directly to a type. I've only shown extraction to an int, but there are overloads for all the built-in types. Since all user-defined types are made up of built-in types, you can overload this function for any type of your choosing and develop a very clear and concise API for file retrieval. There's additional overload, which takes a function pointer, which simply invokes the function and enables a syntax like this. Here, my type is a user-defined type, putter is a string containing a pointer, and id is a string containing an identifier. Hex and dec are functions which tell the stream to change to a hexadecimal representation and decimal representation. So the putter value contains a hex string, while the id contains a decimal string. I mean id, of course, not id. And this is all great, but there's one significant problem. It's amazingly slow, amazingly slow. Extracting a single character can involve invoking three virtual functions on the Microsoft implementation. And while it's true that file IO is much slower than CPU execution, there's no scope for reading blocks of data as anything other than individual extraction of built-in types, unless you count reading a, line of, uh, reading a line to a text buffer. So we can go down a level of abstraction and look at how fstream is implemented. It builds on top of the C library file functions, fopen, fread, and fclose. So let's take a look at those. fopen takes two parameters, a file name and a string, which represents an open mode. And this is the function 
that will be called by the F-stream constructor with the parameters we saw on the last slide. Bear in mind, that means writing code to convert iOS base in to open quotes R, close quotes. Now the return type is a file pointer and we use this in the fread instruction like so. Observe the two size T parameters waiting to catch you out. Observe also the two pointer parameters, one being the file and one being the destination buffer. The file comes at the end of the parameter list rather than the beginning of the parameter list, which is what you would expect as a C++ programmer. The object you operate on should come first. The implicit first parameter of a member function is this. And this looks a little more like what we want. Read some data to a buffer, please. Thanks very much. Being C, we don't get destructors, so we have to manually close the file with the fclose function. And of course, it would make sense to wrap this up into a smaller abstraction than fstream so that you don't accidentally leave a file handle open. All in all, this looks like an improvement. But again, we can do better. Let's drop down a further level of abstraction, and we come to the operating system SDK. And I'm going to stick with Windows here. It's what I know. And we can look how fopen, fread, and fclose are implemented. They build on top of create file, read file, and close handle. Create file takes seven parameters rather than two. And as you can see, this is the joy of abstraction. Much of the complexity is hidden away at higher levels. The first two parameters, the file name and access, are familiar from those abstractions, while the remainder are details related to the operation of the operating system. Nor are there any default parameters. The Windows SDK has to support C as well as C++ and several other languages. You will need to study the correct formulation for the other parameters, which are largely unrelated to what you are trying to actually achieve, which is exchange a file name for a buffer of data. Create file returns a handle, which is used for reading and closing, just as the C functions return a file pointer. The read file function is not too dissimilar from the fread function. It takes a handle and a buffer in a better order, as well as a number of bytes to read, which comes in two parameters in case you want to read more than four gigabytes of data. The final parameter, LV overlapped, is a curious beast, which we'll come on to later, when we drop down another level of abstraction. Finally, we have the close handle function for when we're finished with the file. This is nice and simple, and again, we can wrap the handle in a type so that we can use the constructor and destructor to deal with the lifecycle management. And you might think we've reached the end of the line because now we've, we've left the standard and we're talking to the Windows SDK, but there are a few more concepts to cover and another level of abstraction to drop. We've got down to OS SDK levels of abstraction. What's next? Well, one thing we can do is exploit pages. It's possible to specify the relationship between the memory address range and the offline storage. And this is known as memory mapped file IO or memory mapping. A memory mapped file is a segment of the address space that has been assigned a direct byte for byte correlation with some part of the file or file like resource. This resource is typically a file that is physically present on disk, but can also be a device, shared memory object, or other resource that the operating system can reference through a file descriptor. Now, once present, this correlation between the file and the memory space permits applications to treat the mapped portion as if it were primary memory. So loading a file therefore no longer means calling read file. You simply map a view of a file into the address space, updating the page tables, and dereferencing the address will cause a page fault and read the file into RAM. Now, there are some drawbacks. Your view of the file has to be a multiple of the page size because of page faults, obviously. It has to start on a page boundary. So if you have a four kilobyte page size and you want to read something from the middle of the page, then the entire page will be transferred. This isn't such a hardship, but it requires some careful bookkeeping. But more seriously, it can badly mess up your calculations about how long something is taking to get into RAM. It takes very little time to, make, to map a view of a file. Dereferencing is where the delay happens. It's a blocking call. So when you dereference a pointer to data in the file for reading, your pro process will stall while it reads the page. And this becomes very hard to instrument. One approach is to map the file and read it in on another thread by simply dereferencing data at page size intervals on a loop. This will force the pages into RAM. Mm -hmm. Another approach is to use asynchronous I.O., and this is where the overlapped object comes into play that we saw in the read file function. Now, when a pointer to a correctly initialized overlapped object is passed to read file X, read file EX is a Windows function, the function does not block but returns immediately. The OS completes the call in the background on another thread, and here is where the complexity enters. You provide the buffer, but you should not read the buffer until the I.O. operation is complete, 
And there are several ways of being notified that this has happened. First of all, you can specify an event in the overlapped object, which will be signaled on completion. This is handled in the main message loop as normal. The next method is to use what's called an IO completion port, which is best used when handling large numbers of files. And this is a very complex field. So do feel free to research this yourself. But the final method, and most appropriate for simple usage, is to provide a function pointer to be executed when the IO completes. And this requires the use of read file X rather than read file. This function will be called when the thread which made the original call to read file X is sleeping in an alertable state. Again, this requires bookkeeping. The best approach is to have a separate thread dedicated to making the calls to read file X and receiving the thread notifications. Now, which is better, memory mapped IO or asynchronous IO? That's a tough question. Memory mapped IO is easiest to use, but the hardest to instrument. You may find yourself reading bits of pages from different parts of the device and getting file cache misses. Asynchronous IO bookkeeping is very fiddly and I get mixed results on what the upper limit to file size is. However, it forces users to request their data as soon as they know they want it, which means that there is less blocking going on. Sadly, it's a matter of context. There's no single answer. But recall that the client API is simply a request for a buffer in exchange for a file name. There's nothing to stop you exposing both and offering the choice of memory mapped or asynchronous as part of that API. Now, in closing, let's talk about buses. Because a bus is a communication system that transfers data between components inside a computer. The expression covers all related hardware components and software, including the communication protocol, uh, protocols. It's a contraction of omnibus, the Latin word meaning for everyone. Now we're going to look at four buses, two designed for internal use and two for connecting external peripherals. So the first of these is the SATA bus. Now this was announced back in the year 2000. We could go much further back, frankly. Buses have been with us forever, but I only want to discuss things that are still in common usage. So SATA is an abbreviation for serial AT attachment. So AT is the IBM AT computer back in the 80s. The first version has an upper bandwidth limit of 1.5 gigabits per second. And there is some encoding to take into account, which yields a more realistic transfer rate of 1.2 gigabits per second, which comes to about 150 megabytes per second. Version two was released in April 2004 doubling the bandwidth. And version three was released in May 2009, doubling the bandwidth yet again to 600 megabytes per second. And this is what you'll find in your typical PC nowadays. This bus connects drives to your motherboard via cables, plugs, and sockets. Next, we have the Peripheral Component Internet Interconnect Express Bus, or PCIe. This is a serial bus, which takes advantage of being directly connected to the motherboard rather than communicating via cables. The PCI Express bus was introduced in 2003 with a single lane, offering a transfer rate of a quarter of a gigabyte per second. Each lane is a full duplex byte stream, so you can have up to 16 lanes on a device. So at introduction, PCI Express was capable of four gigabytes per second bandwidth. There's been regular updates to the standard. Version six is due out this year, which will offer 7.8 gigabytes per second on a single lane the theoretical maximum of nearly 128 gigabytes per second over 16 lanes, which this means it could fill up the RAM on my work machine in half a second. The most popular use for the PCIe bus is the connection of external graphics cards. Now the Universal Serial bus has been enormously successful. Introduced in January 1996, USB 1.0 specified a transfer rate of 12 megabits per second, which might seem like overkill for a keyboard where typically you expect to transfer data at a few bytes per second, but it pales into insignificance against the USB 4 specification released in August 2019, which offers transfer rates of 40 gigabits per second. 40. Data is transferred over the serial bus via the processor into RAM or to other devices. And I'm just going to say that again. Data is transferred over the serial bus via the processor into RAM. So the processor is the, is the bottleneck here. This is particularly annoying, given that everything is connected together, but everything needs to be synchronized. And it's that synchronization overhead that we want to minimize. So this brings us to our final topic, which is direct memory access, or DMA. So this is a feature of computer systems that allows certain hardware subsystems to access RAM independent of the CPU. And with DMA, the CPU starts the transfer, and then it does other things during the transfer, and it finally receives an interrupt from the DMA controller. It's called the DMAC. When the operation completes, 
And there are two principles called standard and bus mastering. So standard DMA, also called, also called third party DMA, uses a DMAC which can generate memory addresses and initiate memory read or write cycles. It contains several hardware registers that can be written and read by the CPU. And these include a memory address register, a byte count register, and one or more control registers. And depending on what features the DMAC provides, these control registers might specify some combination of the source and the destination, or the direction of the transfer, reading from or writing to the IO device, or the size of the transfer, or the number of bytes to transfer in a single burst. The CPU initializes the DMA controller with a count of the number of words to transfer and the memory address to use. The CPU then commands the peripheral to initiate a data transfer. The DMA controller then provides addresses and read-write control lines to the system memory. Each time a byte of data is ready to be transferred between the peripheral device and memory, the DMA controller increments its internal address register until the full block of data is transferred. Now, in a bus mastering system, also called first party DMA, the CPU and peripherals can be, each be granted control of the memory bus. Where a peripheral can become a bus master, it can directly write to system memory without the involvement of the CPU, providing memory address and control signals as required. Of course, DMA can lead to cache coherency problems because you've got a, you've got a system filling up RAM independently of the CPU and the CPU holding cache, which is no longer valid. So the issue can be, designed, can be addressed in one of two ways in system design. Either we create cache coherent systems, which implement a method in hardware called bus snooping, whereby external writes a signal to the cache controller, which then performs a cache invalidation for DMA writes or a cache flush for DMA reads. Non-coherent systems leave this to software where the OS must then ensure that the cache lines are flushed before an outgoing DMA transfer is started and invalidated before a memory range affected by an incoming DMA transfer is accessed. The OS must make sure that the memory range is not accessed by any running threads in the meantime. The latter approach introduces some overhead to the DMA operation as most hardware requires a loop to invalidate each cache line individually. Ultimately, we may see NVMe drives pushing data to graphics cards along the PCIe bus without troubling RAM or even SSD storage on graphics cards. But this is all future tech, and the only way of getting predictions correct is to make them after they've happened. So that's offline data. We covered fstream, fopen, fread, and fclose, create file, read file, and close handle, memory mapping, asynchronous IO, buses, and DMA. So there we are. That was quite a lot of material, I do agree. Um, but this is what you need to know to get started with making the most of your hardware. And I hope I've given you plenty of jumping off points and plenty of rabbit holes to dive down. C++ allows you to get very close to the metal, particularly with storage duration and page behavior. But without an understanding of the hardware, you may as well stick with C Sharp or Java. So there is a class of software for which that's quite sufficient. Um, but for me personally, that didn't scratch my itch. I've always wanted to drive hardware as hard as I can. So thanks for listening.